The North European ice is a tundra that has now dominated much of Europe, 5 million AD, making the orchards and vineyards long gone. The world is deep in a period of glaciation, 5 million AD, the planet is once again dominated by ice caps, as it was in the Pleistocene epoch, 2 million BC. So much water is locked up in the ice caps that global sea levels are nearly about 150 meters lower than they were during the Holocene. Ice sheets over a kilometer thick cover most of North America and the whole of Scandinavia, reaching down into Northern Europe. Where once the craggy coastline of southwest Great Britain boasted semi-tropical plants which flourished in coves warmed by the Gulf Stream, there is now blizzard-swept tundra. The continental shelf which spreads out from the British Isles and France is an exposed, frozen plain of sand and gravel deposits and frozen soil. On a winter's night, temperatures fall below minus 60 degrees Celsius and wind chill makes it feel even colder. Come the brief summer, conditions improve a little, the edge of the ice cap lies sparkling to the north, its meltwater running in gravel-choked streams across the flat tundra. Water collects everywhere in lakes and ponds, unable to drain away through the permanently frozen subsoil, or permafrost. Rocks lie in polygonal patterns, covering broad expanses of land. The bitter, boulder-cracking frosts of winter have heaved when up from the soil in successive freeze-thaw cycles and rolled them together in curving lines. Dome-shaped mounds, called pingos, rise up from the tundra, Formed around a core of ice, a pingo occurs where deeper water has sprung through the permafrost or in sites where lakes have progressively frozen from the sides towards the center. Despite the harsh cycle of fierce winters and brief summers, there is life here. The permafrost does not favor deep roots, but certain forms of flora are tough enough to eke out an existence from the frozen soil. Clusters of cotton grass border the lakes, undulating meadows of small, hardy lichens and grasses cover the raised land between the gravel deposits and stream beds. Tight clumps of heather form a rooting site for many varieties of small flowering plants, the only plants which might be considered. D trees are closer to shrubs, and even these hug the ground. Species of willow send their gnarled trunks horizontally and spread their branches across the earth as if unwilling to raise their heads into the bitter winds that will inevitably come with winter. When spring arrives in northern Europe, water from melting ice runs in narrow, muddy torrents between the banks of shingle that choke the riverbed. The thaw softens the surface soil and turns large areas of the tundra into marsh, dotted with pools. Because of the climate conditions, the fly life cycle is accelerated, they mate and reproduce in an incredibly short period of time during the brief thaw. Migrant birds wheel in and out of the swarms, making the best of the bonanza. Migrant birds fare particularly well here. They weather out the winters in less extreme regions further south and travel to these bleak lands in the fleeting summer months to take advantage of the quick and intense growth cycle of the flies. The spring sun will slant through the clouds of insects, illuminating the reddish fireweed, the yellow, powdery male flowers of the low willows and the white heather bells. All these plants grow in shallow pockets of soil in contrast to the orange and yellow lichens that coat the frost-shattered rocks. Shagrits are the largest mammals in the northern European region. Their layered coats protect them from the cold climate of the northern tundra. The shagrit is a species of herd-living, sheep-sized rodent native to the North European ice of 5 million AD ranging from the ice sheet in the north to the edges of the French coniferous forests in the south. A seasonally migratory animal which subsists mainly on tundra grasses, it is the region's largest terrestrial animal in 5 million AD. The shagrit is descended from the alpine marmot. The shagrit evolved from the alpine marmot, but as far as their basic body plan goes, they have not changed much from their ancestors. They are three times larger than marmots as an adaptation against the cold, as larger animals with bigger surface area relative to volume lose less body heat, and have developed typical polar adaptations such as thicker fur and blubber. As marmots are burrowing animals, the shagrit was already well adapted for digging. The shagrit generally resembles its maw, R-M-O-T ancestor, and is also very similar to the South American capybara, the largest modern rodent. It is covered with long, shaggy, dark brown fur all over its body, and is very stocky and thick-set. Its legs are short and stocky, and its ears are small to regulate its internal temperature and prevent heat loss. They retain the large chisel teeth of their ancestors, and have large claws on the feet of their powerful forearms. 
The shagrit's coat is composed of two layers of fur, the dense layer of underfur traps warm air next to the body for insulation, whilst long, waterproof, hollow and air-filled guard hairs keep the underfur dry. This combination heavily insulates the shagrit against the Ice Age winter, and also allows it to briefly enter cold water without being soaked or chilled. Female shagrits give birth in early spring, following a gestation period which lasts throughout the winter. They are resilient against blizzards, and can survive in temperatures as low as minus 50. Shagrits are social animals which live together in herds of around a dozen animals, centered around a dominant bull male. After the females give birth in the early spring, about a third of a herd will consist of youngsters, in particularly cold weather, members of the herd will huddle together for warmth. If one member of the herd smells danger, it barks a warning and the whole herd leaps to attention. An unsettled herd assembles in an open space and, instinctively, the youngsters huddle in the middle, the adults surround them in a defensive formation, all facing outwards. When a predator is present, the shagrits bunch up even more closely, narrowing their eyes and baring their teeth, hissing in threat. The herds spend the winter at the northern edge of the birch and conifer forests south of the tundra, around the area where the French coast once was, they migrate back to the edge of the ice sheet following the end of the winter, to reach their summer grazing grounds. When searching for food after returning to the open tundra, shagrit herds spread out across meadows and root about, pushing rocks ove. R with their strong forelegs to reveal the soil beneath, the big claws on their forefeet dig into the soil to reach underground grass stems and the roots of heather and willow. They must travel massive distances each day in order to find enough food to sustain themselves. Shagrits feed on various types of tundra grasses and cold adapted shrubs, and are themselves the principal prey item of the snowstalker. When in groups they are well defended against predators by their numbers and comparatively large size, but animals like the snowstalker can pick off lost, injured, young, or elderly individuals, or use blizzards as cover to ambush herds. Now the shagrits are in real danger. Not from the blizzard, but from a predator, a snowstalker, that uses the snowstorm as a cover, stalking close to the herd. The snowstalker is a large predatory mustelid native to the North European ice of 5 million AD. It is an apex predator which preys on large animals such as shagrits. The snowstalker is descended from the wolverine, the largest of the mustelid, which were already vicious predators in the human era, though they were not apex predators, as a generalist scavenger and predator which would eat anything it could scavenge or kill, the wolverine was able to survive the human era mass extinction and adapt to fill the niches of extinct predators such as wolves and bears. With the coming of the Ice Age, the wolverine evolved further, developing thick, warm, white fur for insulation and for camouflage, as well as hairy soles for a better grip. The snowstalker's evolution of saber teeth is an example of convergent evolution, as the feature had previously evolved in the saber-toothed cats. The snowstalker is the only known example of a true placental mammal other than a feliform evolving saber teeth. As far as its basic physiology goes, the snowstalker has barely changed compared to its ancestor. It is larger and heavier than the wolverine, weighing up to 35 kilograms and its canines have developed into a pair of saber teeth. It has powerful jaws, with a bite force of 900 kilograms. They are somewhat sexually dimorphic, males are larger than females. The snowstalker's fur is white, providing it with camo. Flage in blizzards and winter storms, and is thick and warm, insulating it from the cold. The soles of their feet are also covered in hair, to insulate them from the cold of the ground, and to help their grip on slippery ice. When they are not breeding or looking after cubs, snowstalkers are solitary and territorial, but because of the thin populations of prey, the territory of a single snowstalker may cover several square miles. They ferociously defend their kills from any other snowstalkers of the same gender that approach. Female snowstalkers do not hold territory of their own, but wander through the territories of males. They will sometimes allow a dominant male to do hunting for them, conserving their own energy, as males will allow females to eat from their kills in return for mating rights. They make their dens in shallow caves, which is usually the only shelter available on the tundra. Because of the massive distances between territories, snowstalkers mate only infrequently. To prevent inbreeding and genetic weakness, the female snowstalker enters estrus every 21 days, and once she mates, her fertilized eggs are held in suspension inside her. 
Eventually, after multiple matings, the embryos are implanted into her womb, and as the winter ends and the summer thaw begins, she will give birth to a litter of cubs born of many different fathers. Female snowstalkers take care of their cubs, traveling massive distances to find food for them, and, to teach them to hunt, mothers will chase prey animals back to their den for them to train on. If they struggle too much, the mother will demonstrate by injuring or outright killing the prey. Mothers also regurgitate food for very young cubs. Because big animals are rare on the tundra, snowstalkers will follow their prey for days, and have evolved a cautious hunting strategy. Using its white coat to blend in with the snow, especially during a blizzard, the snowstalker will ambush and injure, but not kill, its chosen prey item. Instead of risking injury by trying to finish the prey off, the snowstalker will simply trail its wounded victim until it bleeds t. Oh death! During the summer, when boggy greenery is flourishing, its white coat puts it at a disadvantage, though it may try to camouflage against rocky terrain or patches of snow. Snowstalkers always hunt alone. Snowstalker vocalizations are primarily roars and growls, not too dissimilar to human-era big cats such as tigers or leopards. The snowstalker's main prey item is the shagrit, giant rodents which wander the tundra in herds. When in groups, shagrits are well defended against predators by their numbers, and will bunch up together, bare their teeth, and hiss when they feel threatened, but snowstalkers often pick off lost, injured, young, or elderly individuals. In coastal regions, they may try to attack gannet whales or their eggs, but are often repelled by the long beaks of the gannet whales, or by their special defense. When threatened, gannet whales will regurgitate partially digested fish and squid, which is particularly noxious to the sensitive nose of a predator like the snowstalkers. Even with these defenses, gannet whales usually roost on remote islands, and are therefore only at risk when cold winters create ice bridges. The gannet whale has given up flying completely, so its wings can evolve just for swimming, like flippers on a sea lion or a penguin, so it can travel at high speed underwater. The gannet whale is a species of very large semi-aquatic flightless bird native to the North Sea and the coasts of the North European ice in 5 million AD. Descended from gannets, they fill the niches of animals like small-toothed whales. The gannet whale's ancestor, the northern gannet, was a semi-aquatic flying bird. Gannet whales are descended from the northern gannet. Gannets were unique among seabirds in that, when hunting fish, they dived below water and swims with its wings. This behavior, with its necessary adaptations, perfectly positioned the gannet to take advantage of the extinction of the marine mammals and fill absent niches. Their wings have become shorter, like flippers, and their feet have become rudders. About the size of a male walrus gannet whales have a very different physiology to their aerial ancestors resembling pinnipeds more than anything else although they retain their long beaks unable to fly their wings have evolved into stubby paddles similar to fins which help them in swimming their feet are used as rudders although it may not look like it the gannet whale still has a covering of feathers which are much denser and shorter than before streamlining it and making it more aquadynamic below these dense feathers is a layer of blubberbath of which insulate it from the intense cold of the icy seas. The gannet whale has a number of specialized adaptations to its marine existence its nostrils automatically close up when it dives preventing it from breathing water and it has glands above its eyes which secrete excess salt a mineral the gannet whale frequently ingests due to its diet of fish. Gannet whales are semi-aquatic animals which are ungainly and clumsy on land but swift predators in the water where they can swim at up to 30 km an hour steering with their feet they roost and nest on the land going into the sea only to hunt and like their ancestors are social animals roosting in large groups. Gannet whales breed in the summer and lay a single egg frequently nesting in large groups on remote islands the egg which takes a long time to hatch, incubation lasts well into the winter, is protected from the cold by being clutched to the underside of the mother's tail with her feet when the egg hatches a father fishes for food for the hatchling as in human era emperor penguins the young gannet whale also takes a long time to grow into an adult but they live in tightly knit family groups and adults are protective of their young and their eggs. Gannet whales hunt various kinds of fish and squid and are completely safe from predators of their own in the sea although adults are too large and dangerous with beaks capable of delivering serious wounds to be threatened by apex predators such as snowstalkers when they are in a group their eggs and young are vulnerable to predators particularly as time equals 0.2 s greater than unlike the marine mammals gannet whales must lay their eggs on the land 
To avoid predators, gannet whales nest on islands, but in cold enough winters, ice bridges provide access to predators, decimating gannet whale populations. However, they can also defend themselves by regurgitating partially digested fish and squid, which is too much for the sensitive noses of predators. With the end of the ice age, the world warms up and many of the animals that had adapted to the bitterly cold conditions of the ice age are unable to keep up with these rapid changes to their habitat and climate. The fauna of the snowy tundra, shagrits, gannet whales, and snowstalkers, go extinct. The gannet whales were criticized more than any other animal of 5 million AD by viewers who pointed out that 5 million years would not be nearly enough time for gannets to abandon flight and evolve into seal-like birds. Realistically, such drastic evolution would take dozens, if not hundreds of millions of years. The snowstalker is generally regarding as being plausible. However some viewers have pointed out that if the snowstalker attempted to subdue prey in a similar fashion to saber-toothed cats, the forces to its skull would have been to great. While the shagrit is generally regarded as a plausible species, some viewers have pointed out that even following a mass extinction and an ice age, many species of ungulates would be present and there wouldn't be any open niches for the shagrit to occupy, 